please you know, put a note out there for the prayer list also, because that will be sent out to many more people who will hear about your concern. So, um, yes, Floyd. Good. Your own prescription special for you? Yeah. That will be great. Trinity? Um, I learned yesterday that my sister-in-law, Doreen, uh, found out that she had a blockage in one of her arteries. Mm. She was a very healthy person. She'd lost a ton of weight over the years, and she was out running and all that kind of thing. And, uh, apparently, they can't do a stent, so they are going to do a whole bunch of blocked arteries. Mm. As you can imagine, having a blocked artery sitting around waiting for an appointment. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's impressive. Yes. So let's. Oh, Dream. Oh, I'm sorry. I yes, Bob is here. I know Chris had Chris Gab Gabrielson had surgery this week. How is she doing? Okay, yeah, she get the rest she needs. <laughs> okay, well, it seems there is a lot that we have on our plates this this Sunday morning. So, let's just take a moment of prayer to remember all of those people that have been mentioned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that moment of silence. And as we move on, we conduct our lives as a constant prayer for everyone, including ourselves. So thank you very much. And now our daily word will be offered for us by Andrew. Today is Sunday, June 12th, 2016. Today's words are divine order. Our affirmation is, love leads the way to divine order. In war-torn biblical times, Naomi and her daughters-in-law, Ruth and Orpah, lost their husbands. Ruth, in a courageous act of devotion to Naomi, pledged her commitment to stay with Naomi, return to her homeland, and adopt her people and God. Like Ruth, I follow my heart and do the right thing. Despite any outer experiences to the contrary, divine order prevails in my life. I devote myself to what serves the greater good. The order is reestablished, even out of chaos, when I follow my heart. In Hebrew, Ruth's name means love, and love is always at the helm of order. I follow my heart in all circumstances and let love lead the way. Our scripture is Ruth 1.16. Do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Wherever you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God is my God. Let us acknowledge this sacred moment by singing surely the presence. As you all know, David is not with us this morning. He has a lot going on in his life. So 
We are honored to have a guest with us. There's a man who I've known for several years and has been a friend of Living Water for several years and has been teaching workshops in this building. I know several of us are probably familiar with him. And uh, I will probably read to make sure I get his, uh, his bio correct here. He's an international corporate trainer. He's facilitated top-level leadership trainings in Mexico, Bangkok, Germany, Spain, and extensively throughout the US. His clients have included Ford, Gerber, Mazda, United Airlines, and multiple branches of the US government. In his professional career, he has led over 1,000 seminars on leadership and personal development. His business degree is from Arizona State University and his master's in spiritu spiritual psychology offer an educational background that is both practical and visionary. He has provided one-on-one -on -one coaching to over 2,000 individuals. Author of the best-selling book, Outrageously Fulfilling Relationships, a collection of 26 uncommon but vital incense, <laughs> insights from his syndicated column, Focus on Relationships. He's in his 38th year of leading personal development seminars and is the founder of the Love, Courage, and Achievement Project, a weekend and seven-week program offered in Denver that effectively helps people through the barriers that have held them back and propels them toward the creation of an extraordinary life. Well, ha, huh, I read that all. <laughs> Sorry for so much reading, but I wanted to share that with you. I know I've been involved in his workshop. I believe Michael uh, has also worked with Randy. Yes, <laughs> and, yeah, and I know Chris and, and Bob Gabrielson have, and I, I don't know how many others, but uh, it is an honor to present to you Randy Ferguson. Thank you so much. Good morning. I hope you're ready to have some fun. Uh, one thing that I notice when I'm here, um, in every single case, is I feel extraordinarily welcomed. You just have a warmth here. There's a sense of home here, and, uh, and I feel it. I feel empowered, and so uh, I just want to thank you right off the bat. And uh, uh, I know that we had our greeting, but I'm going to ask you to do just a real quick little exercise. I'm going to ask you to... Um, uh, turn to the right, turn to the left, see the magnificence, the soul, the presence in the people around you. Would you just do that for a moment? Just look left and right and do it with the intention. See the magnificence that's there. So is, is there something precious about the people that you just took a look at? Isn't that true? Yeah, well, what about the person who was doing the looking? So today is called Embracing the Tiger, and uh, it is a technology that we've been developing. I'm now in my 38th year of, of doing this work, uh, and it, what it does is it goes after this thing called self-judgment. Uh, for how many of you are you harder on yourself than anybody else? Do you know what I mean? And one of the things that people really start to become clear about is... Uh, a notion that we're not taught in our culture. And the notion is that you have a relationship with yourself. Now, in our culture, we're not taught that. You know, you've got a relationship with everybody else, but what do you mean relationship with self? And yet, isn't there a way that you speak to you? Isn't there a way that you regard you? Isn't there a way that you hold you? Uh, and so what people start to see in this work is, oh my gosh, I do have a relationship with self. And then the next thing that comes up is, and that relationship could use a little work. <laughs> so what happens with the best of intentions is that we tend to go through life in this relationship with self often uh, uh, as quite the taskmaster. And uh, one of the things that we say in the workshops is that you will never, ever, 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 ever beat yourself into magnificence. And as Dr. Phil says, how's that working for you? Do you know what I mean? So today we're going to be taking a look at something that uh, we call embracing the tiger. And uh, it's a technology that actually my brother who does this work in Houston developed uh, 
many years ago, and, uh, uh, and it's my honor to share it with you now. It's, it's been quite li life-altering for people. So um, how many of you believe in the wisdom of children? Do you know, like kids do say the darndest things. So I want to share with you about three children today. And the first is uh, a little boy named Shane. And uh, this was written by a veterinarian. He goes, I had, uh, I'd been called to examine a 10-year-old Irish wolfhound named Belker. The dog's owners, Ron and his wife, Lisa, and their little boy, Shane, were all very attached to Belker, and they were hoping for a miracle. I examined Belker and found he was dying of cancer. I told the family we couldn't really do anything for Belker and offered to perform the euthanasia procedure for the old dog in their home. As we made arrangements, Ron and Lisa told me they thought it would be good for six-year-old Shane to observe the procedure. They felt as though Shane might learn something from the experience. The next day, I felt a familiar catch in my throat as Belker's family surrounded him. Shane seemed so calm, petting the old dog for the last time that I wondered if he understood what was going on. Within a few minutes, Belker slipped peacefully away. The little boy seemed to accept Belker's transition without any difficulty or confusion. We sat together for a while after Belker's death, wondering aloud about the sad fact that animals' lives are shorter than humans' lives. Shane, who had been listening quietly, spoke up, saying, I know why. Startled, we all turned to him. What came out of his mouth next stunned me. I'd never heard a more comforting explanation. He said, people are born so they can learn how to live a good life, like loving everybody all the time and being nice, right? The six-year-old continued, well, dogs already know how to do that, so they don't have to stay so long. <laughs> So, we, uh, we do have our curriculum here, don't we? One of the things that we share in the workshop is that, for the most part, human beings are committed to their comfort, whether or not it's fulfilling. But God is committed to our fulfillment, whether or not it's comfortable. Just try that one on. And what that means is that can't we be count, counted upon? Can't we count on this notion that we are brought the next lesson and the next and the next and the next to evolve us as human beings. Does, it, does that resonate? That we can count on the universe bringing us the lessons that we need to evolve, and we get those lessons whether we like it or not. Isn't that true? Yeah. So uh, one of the things I notice in my own life uh, is this thing called aging. <laughs> and uh, we get this lesson, thank God it only happens a day at a time. Otherwise, you know, imagine waking up and going, ah! So we, we get these lessons. We get these lessons in our life. And so uh, one of the biggest lessons that we get is in the area of self-judgment and self-sabotage. Uh, one of the things that we've noticed over time is that for most people, in terms of handling the issues in their life, it's not so much that they don't know what to do. It's that they have difficulty getting themselves to do it on a consistent basis. That's the challenge. So what is it in us that sometimes has a self-sabotage that, uh, that attracts lessons into our life that can often be painful or lessons that keep us in a state of almost like being stuck? So what is that? Uh, we, we came up with this notion of core issues uh, many, many years ago. And it was really funny. My brother was a divorce attorney. And he didn't like to go in front of the judge. He always liked to settle out of court. And what he discovered was that when his clients came in, they had these, uh, uh, all these emotions and upset and animosity for their soon-to-be ex. And what he discovered that was so powerful was that if there was a way of dismantling the animosity, then they could settle in about 15 minutes. You know, this is what we're going to do with the kids. This is what we're going to do with the property. This is what we're going to do with income, et cetera. You take the animosity out, stuff goes very fast. You put the animosity in, it can take years. And so Bill's heart was in creating peace. And so, um, so he did that, which might be why he's not an attorney anymore. <laughs> so... I mean, no offense, uh, but 
anyway, that's, that, was, that was how he came up with this core issue stuff because what he discovered was a way of dismantling this adversariness that we have inside for other people and for ourselves even. So there's three steps to resolving and healing core issues. And I'm, I just, one thing I, I know about, especially this group, is that you come in with tremendous wisdom. So I'm going to ask you, challenge you to just let it resonate. If it's something rings as true inside, take it for yourself. If it doesn't ring as true, then just let it go. Okay. You willing to do that? All right. So what the, the three steps are, number one, we talk about core issues. There's a description of core issues. Then the second one is to find out what your core issues are. And then the third is to heal it. So uh, story, this is the second little boy that had a huge breakthrough. There's this little boy, and, and he's so excited about going to the county fair. And because uh, he's going to have this just wonderful day, right, ride the rides and do all this cool stuff. And then he's going to go see his grandma. So he, uh, he goes to the fair and he decides he's going to get his face painted. And he's in line. As he's waiting in line to get his face painted, there's this little girl right next to him. And she goes, you can't get your face painted. You have freckles. Freckles are ugly. You can't get your face painted. And he was crushed. He never thought freckles were ugly. And, he, you know, he did his rides. He had a pretty good time, but he's still kind of feeling down when he goes to grandma's. And grandma picks it up and goes, honey, what's wrong? What's the matter? She goes, he goes, I have freckles and freckles are ugly. And she looks at him and goes, are you kidding? Freckles are beautiful. What could possibly be more beautiful than freckles? And this little boy looks up and he looks at her and he goes, wrinkles. <laughs> so what we can do is we can, we can be pretty harsh on ourselves, can't we? So here's, here's the nature of core issues. You can't grow up in this culture and not get hurt. I guarantee you every single person in this room has been hurt and not just a little bit. I mean punched in the stomach by your best friend kind of hurt. We've all been hurt like that. And because children are egocentric, meaning that to kids, the world revolves around them. If something wonderful happens, it's because of me. Something terrible happens, it's because of me. And so kids take things very personally. When we grow up, we move to a great extent. We move from the heart to the mind because the mind doesn't have to feel. That protects us. But as a little kid, we don't have that. And so when we get hurt, it's like Rod Stewart sings that song, The First Cut's the Deepest. It hurts when dad doesn't come home and mom's worried. It hurts when there's addictions in the family. It hurts when no matter what you do, it's not a good enough in your parents' eyes. And we don't see that dysfunctionally, that Family dysfunction is modeled from generation to generation. Little kids don't go, oh, this is purely a case of multi-generational dysfunctionality. I shouldn't take it personally. <laughs> kids don't do that, right? No, to them it hurts. And here's what kids do. They take it so deeply, and what they do is they start making decisions about who they are, their very essence. And they don't even see it as decisions. To them, it's discoveries. I'm no good. I'm stupid. Dad told me. I'm ugly. I don't matter. I don't have what it takes. I'm not worth loving. I'm a disappointment. And kids take it so deeply. And what we know in this work, in New Thought work, is that when you take a thought and you imbue it with intense emotion, that becomes a catalyst for change, doesn't it? And it becomes a catalyst of change even if the thought is inaccurate. And all judgment is inaccurate. No judgment exists in the physical universe. You know, here's a rock, here's a screen, here's a chair, show me a not good enough. You see what I mean? No judgment exists in the physical universe. Take all the people off the planet, there's no judgment on the planet. The planet's probably doing a heck of a lot better. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So even though that's true, if we don't have the consciousness, what happens is we get hurt 
We make up judgments against self. We imbue it with tremendous hurt, and that becomes the catalyst for change. Does that make sense? Okay. So, that's the nature of core issue. Now, a couple other characteristics is your core issues are going to be the sore spots in your life. That when just the right circumstance happens out there, we get triggered and we end up with something that we call upset. So people will sometimes say, how do I know if I have any core issues? <laughs> that always makes me laugh. Well, two ways. One is if you're breathing. The other is, the other is here's the litmus test. You know you have core issues if you ever get upset about anything. Because where does upset live, out there or in here? Upset lives in here, and it wouldn't live in here if there wasn't something in here getting upset. To me, one of the most valuable things we can do in our lifetime is to find out what those core issues are. Because once you bring them into the light, know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Isn't that true? That's the beginning of the end of the power of the core issues. So, another characteristic of core issues is that they will be what drives you. If you ever notice that you're driven to something, people with a core issue of failure are driven to success. People with a core issue of not work, worth loving, they're driven to have everybody like them. People with a core issue of not good enough are driven to perfectionism and control. So, it's what drives us in our, in our lives. Uh, the, Avoid, we will do anything to avoid the hurt of core issues, anything. And what a, oh, a perfect format for addiction. If you take a look, what addiction is, is the avoidance of that deep, deep hurt. And then we go to the fridge or the drugs or sex or work or whatever the addiction is. So, uh, core issues. I know, it's, I know it's a heavy topic. But boy, imagine, imagine what life would be like if you could live without self-judgment. Having intelligent discernment, yes. But what if you could live without that beat up inside? Another thing about core issues is, boy, do they show up in relationships. So you got Bobby and you got Susie. Bobby and Susie are brought together. They are madly in love with each other, intense chemistry. Little do they know that they have been brought to each other divinely to work out their own core issues. You don't hear that at the altar. Do you know what I mean? They are brought together, okay? And then time goes on, and let's say Bobby's got a core issue of failure, Susie's got a core issue of not worth loving, okay? So Bobby, it, out of his core issue of failure, he's a workaholic, so he spends two hours more than he agreed at work. He comes home, and Susie goes, where were you? I had dinner ready two hours ago. I was worried. What happened? Now, if Bobby's got a core issue of failure and she says those words, what does he hear? What did he do? He failed. All that hurt comes up. He gets reactivated. He goes, well, look, somebody's got to make a living. And if Susie's got a core issue of not worth loving, what does she hear? Yeah, yeah. And so she goes, well, you could have called. That's just common courtesy. He hears, I failed. Look, why don't you just give me some space? Don't ever say that to somebody with a core issue of not worth loving. You want space? I'll give you space. You see what happens? And it's reaction, 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 reaction. Is there any communication taking place? No, no. It's just reaction, reaction, reaction. And when this happens, day after day after day after day, it destroys the experience of love, which is what drew them together in the first place. What makes the difference in relationships is the presence or the absence of the experience of loving. When that experience is present, relationships are great. When it's absent, boy, there's something missing. And so one of the most important things we can do if we want to live in the experience of loving on a day-to-day -day basis is to learn how, how do we heal core issues? How do we drop that? How do we drop the core issues that create such fear and avoidance in our lives? So that's a little bit about the nature of core issue. Second part of core issue is how do you find it? How do you discern 
what the core issues are. Well, to do that, you have to move out of the mind and into the heart. Because the core issues don't live in the mind. They live in the gut. Your core issues have nothing to do with the truth. They have nothing to do with logic. If that were the case, they'd already be resolved, right? They live in here. The way, like I said, the way you know that you've got core issues is if you ever get reactivated. Uh, and so far, I haven't met any humans who don't. <laughs> Certainly, I don't. So how do you find your core issue? You go on a hunt for it. Normally, our whole life, if something's upsetting, what we do is we, we get as far away from Dodge as fast as we can, right? So the problem is that when we run from core issues, we give it power. Well, if running from it gives it power, what's going to take away its power? Do the exact opposite. That's what we're going to do this afternoon. We're going to go on a hunt. We're going to go on a, in a process where you discover the core issue and pull the plug on it. And that, to me, that's exciting. So what happens is you start to go after your core issue, you bring it into the light, it starts to lose its power. How do you find it? Your core issue will be the word or words that if it was true, we know it's not, but if it was true, would hurt the most. By a show of hands, how many of you have repeating negative patterns in your life? Like maybe you attract a certain kind of person, or maybe there's, uh, you have trouble uh, uh, with procrastination, but there's patterns in your life that sabotage. I, I just, okay, great, thank you. I, I, I wasn't going to ask you to raise your hands, but. So consider the possibility that the reason we procrastinate isn't because we're lazy. That's not why people procrastinate. People procrastinate because they're afraid. What they're afraid of is that if they were to really go for it, if they were to give it 100% and then they failed, that would be unconfrontable. And then they weren't good enough, that would be unconfrontable. And then they're not worth loving, that would be unconfrontable. Better to hold back. But that's not what we're meant for. What you're meant for is to soar. That's what your spirit wants to do. Little kids don't hold back, you know? They just go for it. So, it will be the word of words that if it was true, that's what would hurt the most. And the funny thing is, we have a whole culture with core issues where people wake up in the morning trying to gather all the evidence on the outside that they're not what they judge themselves to be on the inside. And can you ever do it? Can you ever get enough evidence? Can you ever get enough money, enough people to like you, enough possessions? Can you ever get enough evidence on the outside to make your core issues go away on the inside? You can't. You can't. But we'll spend a lifetime trying. What would it be like if you could just love you the way that you are? And now we're going into the third step, which is once you have the core issues, how many of you suspect just maybe... There might be an insy fitsy little possibility you could have a core issue. Okay, good. All right, good. So how do you heal the core issue? The way that you heal it is to do the exact opposite of what you'd think. What we think is, I'm just going to affirm the opposite. I am smart enough. I am attractive. I am good. I am whatever. But... As Dr. Phil says, how's that working for you? My point is that there's something else that heals core issues. Consider the possibility that out of core issue, what we do is we make our relationship, the love that we have for our relationship, conditional. In other words, we have uh, an as soon as list. As soon as I lose that weight, as soon as I get this next degree, as soon as I get my 401k, as soon as I get the debt paid off, as soon as my kids grow up, as soon as I get a spouse, as soon as I get rid of the one I have, as soon as, as soon as, as soon as, then I'll be happy. Then I can love me. But how many of you have noticed that your as soon as list grows faster than your ability to check the items off? Do you know what I mean? 
So it puts us on a squirrel cage where we work so hard day after day after day after day, but there's no breakthrough. Consider the possibility that what's going to heal your core issue is the most powerful force in the universe, which is love. Not the concept of love, but the experience of it. Take a, just a moment. When you're in the experience of love, let's just do this. Imagine for a moment, just recall for a moment, a time when you were in the presence of somebody who absolutely loved you. Somebody who loved you with all their heart. And when you were in the presence of somebody who loved you that way, and you were letting it in, what, what was present in that experience? Just shout it out. What was present when you were in the experience of love? Peace. Joy. What else? Yeah, happiness. What else? Confidence. Feeling. What's your creativity like? What's your enthusiasm like? What's your motivation like? Through the roof. When you're in the experience of love, you're living congruently with your nature. We're, this isn't who we are, right? It's the package. It's our command module while we're on the planet, right? When you're living in the experience of love, consider the possibility you're living congruently with your very nature, and that just plain feels good. That's where your quality of life goes through the roof, and that's what heal, heals core issues. When you can love you with your core issue, that's a breakthrough. In other words, something comes along that says that you're not good enough. Maybe your parents said that all the time. No matter what you did, it could have been better. If you got all A's and one B, you know, that was a problem. So you decided that your very nature wasn't good enough. Instead of spending the rest of our life trying to prove that you're good enough, what if you could love you if you were never good enough? Now, in your actions, you're committed to excellence, but this is all a conversation of the heart. What if you could love you with the core issue? What if you could love you without condition? What if, what if your whole and complete and human and fallible, and that's part of your beauty? What if you could love that? What if, just consider this, how much of your precious life energy has been about trying to prove that you're not your core issue? And what if you didn't have to do that anymore? What if you could, what if Denise could just love Denise? Bert could just love Bert. You know, I mean, it's like, we all love Bert, but, right? What if you could just love you as an, and this whole thing wasn't just a concept, but it was an experience deep in your heart, what difference would that make? So, this is, this is, this is big. Uh, so I've got one more little story that I'll share with you, and it's the third little boy. And th this little boy, like my dear friend Michael, loves music, loves music. His mom finds out that Paderewski, this is back in the 30s and 40s. Paderewski is giving a concert in Warsaw. And this poor little Polish lady decides she's going to save and save and save and save and get enough money for her, her little boy, and her best friend to go to this concert. And she does it. She pulls it off. So they get ready for this concert. The night's coming. They get dressed up as best they can. And here's this beautiful, beautiful European theater. They walk in. It's like, Wow. They find their seats, and, and this mom turns over. She's talking to her best friend, and they're having this conversation. She turns back to talk to her little boy, and he's gone. He's gone. You know, like Caleb. He's just like, you know, he's gone. And, and she looks around. She can't figure it out. Well, well what Caleb did is, it wasn't Caleb, but <laughs> walks down the aisle, walks up these stairs. There's this beautiful uh, doorway there. It says, no admittance. Walks right through. And he's backstage, and he's looking around, and man, there's these pulleys and lights and wires, and, and, and then he sees it. There's this huge concert grand piano, and he just happens to know how to play Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. 
He walks over to this piano. He sits himself down, and he starts playing. Dun, 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 dun. Just then, house lights dim, stage lights brighten, curtains part, and he's playing Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star for Heads of State. And mom is like, you know, she doesn't know what to do. And the whole audience is incredible, incredibly uncomfortable. What do you do with a situation like that? Well, just then, the maestro, Paderewski, walks out. And he walks up behind this little boy, leans over, and he goes, keep playing, keep playing. And the little boy's going, dun, 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 dun. And then just then, he reaches around, and he starts to play this incredible bass, the twinkle, twinkle, little star. He starts to play this incredible treble, the twinkle, twinkle, little star. And they start the concert with a standing ovation. What is most important? To be superhuman, which we can never do? You keep your standards of excellence. Or to wrap your arms around you the way that you are. And the funny thing is that when you do that in your heart, not up here, but when you do that in your heart, what happens is the same things that used to reactivate you and drive you and, and have you filled with fear, they're not there anymore. And then you get to step into the magnificence that you truly are as a human being. What if? What if? We're going to have our workshop between, uh, what is it, 12.30? Yeah, 12.30 to 2.30. We're going to have two hours together. I can't wait to spend that time with you. Um, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for letting me come and be with you this morning. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you so much to Randy Ferguson for being with us today. It was an honor and a pleasure to listen again. It's been a while. And please be at his workshop. We have a little time to catch some lunch and be back here by 12.30. So I hope you'll join everyone here today. And now it is time for our meditation. So please join in singing, I Cast All My Cares. We come here to be filled. As we close our eyes, let us pause to be filled with gratitude. Gratitude for the gift of breath. Allow your being to expand, to be filled with the potential of your eternal spirit. Feel the light of love that you carry within you.
as we near the time to leave this quiet place. Allow that light to fill you and expand beyond all boundaries. It is the light of love that saves us. It is the light of love that keeps us strong. As we come back into this time and space, let us come back with the word Alleluia. Now we will take an offering for unity. I'd like, like to thank those who join us on the internet for being with us. And if you'd like to make a contribution to supporting this ministry, there's a button on the web page that'll allow you to do so. So as we take our offerings in our hands, we bless them with these words. Divine love bless, blesses and multiplies all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive. I give in love because I trust in God. And once again, it's time to enjoy Trinity Damask and Irreverence. Just a little note, I um, discovered that today is Victoria